So the person who's going to be speaking to us, her name is Kimberly Jo Smith. And Sean and I uh, met her. I, I'm not going to say that accident because I don't believe in coincidence or accident in life. But we were up in Nauvoo, uh, staying at a beautiful place. It is called the Nauvoo Vacation Villas. Nauvoo Vacation Villas. We've stayed there several times now. I told them we either need stock or huge discounts. Mm -hmm. Next time we go. Yeah. But while we were there, um, I met Kim, and I just kind of had this feeling to get to know her a little bit. We don't normally do that with the person who's checking you in, but there was just kind of a, a connection there. And when she told me her name, and then she mentioned that she had that she was related to Joseph and Emma Smith. I mean, wow, that's kind of cool. And then as we talked a little bit longer, I also discovered that she is a convert to the church. So uh, there's a connection when you meet another convert. Not that we're not all converts, but it's always a little exciting. I know, we're all converts, right? So we came up and we were up there another time. We took my daughter and granddaughter um, just a few weeks ago. My granddaughter just got her mission call to the Jacksonville Florida Mission. We're excited about that. So we took her up there and saw Kim again. And then we got talking and Kim mentioned that she's done fire signs. I said, wow, you know, we've done a couple at our home here. We would love to have you come. So she has agreed to come this evening. Now she told me she has a soft voice. So I'm sure if we stay quiet in here, everyone will hear her. But when the spirit hits her, because she is from the South, she <laughs> might be screaming hallelujah, you never know. But anyway, let's welcome Kimberly Joseph. Well, no, no, really, thank you so much. And let me just mention, it's an even deeper connection if it's Southern converts. <laughs> And if, if we're not careful, we start talking like this. <laughs> it's about a hand. <laughs> but I'm so happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this fireside for a long, long time. So just a little bit about me. Um, I am a convert to the church. I want to talk about my conversion. Uh, but I'm from Tennessee originally and now live in Nauvoo, Illinois, part-time. I hope to soon also be living in far west part-time because I have a lot of things to do in both places. Um, and I do work at Nauvoo Vacation Villas with my friend Sherry Saint back there, who is my boss. <laughs> so I'll not say anything bad about it. And uh, no, it, yeah, come stay with us when you come to Nauvoo. It's like the best place ever. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that happened after Joseph's death and why Emma stayed in Nauvoo. And then I'll share a, a song with you and then talk about my conversion story. So with that, get started. So my son and I have been doing these firesides for like 20 years, but he got married two years ago and I want grandkids. So I'm just happy to do this by myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we call our firesides healing the ties that bind because it deals with trying to bring um, our families together and uniting them and overcoming issues of the past and just processing grief that we've experienced as a result of people betraying us and hurting us. And it's something we need to find that balance with in these latter days, because we need to be able to find a way to love one another, despite our differences. Um, that's like one of the first two commandments, there's part of the first the two important commandments is that we get to that area and align ourselves with it. And when it comes to my family, it's just that this line of the Smith family has had to deal with a lot of generational things that's been passed down that we were told growing up about the church and about Brigham Young and uh, just a lot of rumors that we heard that caused there to be this huge wall that, that went up. And so this is why we like telling our story because we did find a way to process all of that and to be able to um, find a way to just let it go and focus on our role in the gospel today and being a family today. And we feel like if, if we can do what we've done and come back full circle, then any family can, because it isn't a Smith family problem. It's a human family problem. And so that's why we, we're out here talking about it. And um, so with that, I just want to start with a few visuals because when it comes to, you know, lineage and pictures, that's nice when you can see what the connection is. <clears throat> so I come through Joseph and Emma they're my second great grandparents through their son, Alexander. Alexander Hill Smith married Elizabeth Agnes Grindel. Elizabeth was actually raised by Emma from the age of eight. Um, and so they actually grew up together and had a very, very loving marriage. 
their son, Arthur Marion Smith, married Minerva Catherine Smith, who was a different Smith altogether out of Indiana. And then their son, Joseph Frederick Smith, is my father. He married Mary Sue Roberts. He's still alive, lives in Springfield, Missouri. He's one of, I think he may be the only great grandson left living now. <clears throat> he has a sister that's still, still alive. So that's the line I come through. Now, I wasn't a descendant if I didn't start with a little bit of humor. It is true, Joseph had a sense of humor. Unfortunately, it's magnified as the generations have gone by. <laughs> but this is actually a true story that's been passed down um, about when President George Albert Smith was getting ready for a general conference in Utah. And he heard that his cousin Israel was going to be visiting uh, Utah right around the same time. So he sent an invitation for his cousin Israel to come in and be at general conference. And Israel, to his surprise, accepted. And so it was this a great event for the people back in Utah and, and President Smith was telling all of his friends and his family, his Ward family, uh, the weeks leading up to conference, let's make him feel right at home. Uh, we'll, we'll just welcome him in and, and just be a family to him. Let's not proselyte him to death and scare him off. And so as general conference was starting and people were getting seated, um, he had Israel stand up and he introduced them to everybody. And he said, now we want to make Israel feel right at home, and we promise not to proselyte you to death, teasing him. And he said, now let's get this meeting started with the hymn, Israel, Israel, God is calling. <laughs> I'm sorry. So a lot of people ask me about the children of Joseph and Emma. Five of Joseph and Emma's children lived to adulthood. The ages of those children at the time of their father's death was zero to 13, Emma was still carrying their unborn son, David. So this is a really young age to have to lose a parent. And you have to figure in also who he was and the dynamics that come with that and the manner in which he met his death, which is this, all one of those things alone is traumatic for a child, but you have all of these levels going on. And then you have David who never knew his father, and he was very haunted uh, by that. And so adults are uh, equipped to be able to handle this kind of loss that these little children aren't. <clears throat> so it was very, very hard on them. Excuse me. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you some pictures of some of the children. This is Julia Murdoch Smith, who's one of the twins that Joseph and Emma adopted. Julia was 13 when Joseph was killed. Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith III was 12. Frederick Granger William Smith was 8. And I don't know why my great grandfather so unhappy in this picture, but he was six years old when Joseph was killed. And of course, Emma was expecting David and his picture of David as an adult and Emma holding him. This is one of the earliest pictures we have of Emma. You can see she's got the gold bead necklace Joseph gave her before he died. You can also see that she has one eye that droops. This is because she had many strokes when she had her children, so she had to deal with palsy. Um, something else you may not know about Emma was that she was left-handed, uh, and she also had a habit of when she had her apron on and she would talk to people, she would roll the corner back and forth and up and down, and that's a habit I have, and my sister has too. And um, she also loved to make baked goods. She always kept twisted donuts for the grandkids. A uh, really fun story about uh, her donuts is that she had a, a round puff pastry that she made, and she could not stand politicians. And they'd always come and talk to Joseph, especially during the election time. And there was one politician that always eat up all of her little puff pastries. And he said, these are so good. What do you call them? And she said, candidates, all uh, puffed up and full of hot air. <laughs> <laughs> she, she had a quick wit. And um, <laughs> uh, it was pretty funny. So there's a book that you can get that's uh, a collection of um, memoirs from her grandchildren. For a lot of these little tidbits are in there. And so that, that's really fun, fun to read. I think it's called Reflections of Emma. So I know these they look like a gang of outlaws. This is the children of Joseph and Emma Smith as young adults. I, I love this picture though. And up on the left, bottom with the tall hat is actually Emma's second husband, Louis Spiderman. And then to his left is Frederick Granger William Smith, then Joseph Smith the third and then David Hiram Smith, and then Alexander Hale Smith. And Joseph Smith III is pointing at something in a book that he has, and we have no idea what it is. I'd like to know what that is. Mm -hmm. But um, I just want to put a little plug in for Lewis because he gets a bad rap. Lewis uh, Vitamin was known to have a few faults, but 
he did love the Latter-day Saint people, and the mob had warned anybody that was living in the city, if they helped any of the Mormons escape, they would be killed as well. And he risked his life several times getting the Latter-day Saint people out. So we highly respect him uh, for doing that. So I often get asked who was the first descendant to join the church. That would have been Joseph Smith III, who was baptized by his father. And then, of course, he chose the way of the reorganized church, and that would make the next one to be Alice Frederica Smith, who was a daughter to Joseph's son, Freddie. Uh, she was out in Utah and met several of her cousins and was converted out there. But when she came back home, uh, she was so ostracized by the family that she left the church. So that makes Gracia Jones the first descendant to join and remain in the church. And she was uh, baptized in 1956. And she was the one who spearheaded the movement to get up our, all of our families to come to the reunions, non-members and members alike, to start coming to family reunions so that at least we could get acquainted with one another and, and find out that our cousins in Utah don't have horns and all these weird things that we heard growing up. Uh, so that was a great work that she she took up. I met her in 1998. I actually reached out to her because I wanted to come to the reunions, and we became very, very good friends. She's a really neat lady. So I this is one of the things I emphasize in my firesides because it's, it's at the core of what, you know, I feel like we all need to, to work on in these days, and that's Matthew 22, 35 through 40. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart and all of thy soul and with all of thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So... You know, it's like, it doesn't matter how much good we do on a daily basis. We can do all the checklists of all the good things we should be doing for people. But if we don't have those first two in place, all the rest goes out the window. And that's what that means, that all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. And and so it's so important that we find a way to align ourselves with these these two commandments. Um, and that, that helps us in the process uh, in forgiving and letting go of issues of the past. And so it's so easy to get up here and say, yeah, we have to forgive people and, and let it go. Because once we're hurt and betrayed by somebody that's a very trusted friend or family member, it's that's a huge betrayal, huge. And I always tell people, anger is a natural event that you're going to feel once you go through that kind of pain. It's just naturally you're going to feel anger. It's what we do with it that counts. Because anger will go down a one-way street, and either go left to love and forgiveness or go right to hatred. And we're the ones that have to take the steering wheel and take it where it needs to go. If we do nothing, it becomes a residue that stays inside of us and just sits there until the adversary uses it against us. Because one day it will trigger and come out. And so I, I try to tell people, find what that process is for you to help you deal with what's happened to you. If it's prayer and meditation, talking to a counselor, a bishop, whatever it's, it's going to take for you to process this and find a way to forgive somebody and, and then be able to let it go. And one of the things I've learned in my own experiences is there's two kinds of pain. There's memory pain and there's heart pain. Here's where you remember it. Here's where you feel it. So here's where you have to process it. And once you can process it through the atonement and let go and find that state of forgiveness, this up here starts to disappear. And you might be able to remember it sometimes, but you don't feel it anymore because that's gone and the Lord has replaced it with peace. And so that's that's one of the things we all, that's one of the things I've had to work, work through on many levels, not just in my personal life, but just in just this generational thing of, of turmoil that's happened just in my family. And I'm sure every family has to deal with that as well, of um, these things that were never dealt with that tumble down and land on us. And so it's it's so important to find whatever works for you to process um, issues of the past and the present. So what, one of the reasons I started doing research for, for my book, I had to find I had to find an understanding for why my father's family was the way it was. And as I did research on that the Smith family, I found that the tools of the adversary that he loved the most was division, contention, 
rumor and misperception, judgment, and the inability to forgive and let go. And the, what triggered this for me was I come from a mountain southern gospel family mm-hmm. on my mama's side. And they, even though they had, they may not like some of the family members, they always stood up for them. You know, you don't talk against Ken. You just don't do that. And they, they always supported each other on my dad's side. But once I was a teenager and around them, there were cousins that lived 20 miles away from each other that had never met. And they were so bitter. They were just bitter about so many things. And there was a lot of contention in there. And I just, I didn't like that because I love how the, the pure love of Christ and the fullness of joy feels. And I, I want everybody to have that, everybody be happy and get along. So as I, it took me 15 years to write my book, Rising Hills and Sinking Valleys, because I would go through some of these issues of the, of the past for the Smith family. And I would have to, put it away because it would make me sick. It would make me physically ill. Some of the things that happened to them and happened amongst them. And so it took me a while to do, but I did pick up on this pattern and I was like, okay, so what What do I need to do with this? And so that was me as an adult. So I'm gonna, I'll talk a little more about that later. Right now I wanna talk about Emma for just a minute and some of the reasons why she stayed in Nauvoo, and and just to give it an understanding, because I like to tell people, don't look at Emma as the prophet's wife, because that puts her up here. Let's look at Emma as a woman, a mother, and a wife who's lost more than probably any of us can imagine, and has gone through horrendous traumas and throughout her marriage. And um, so when they were living in Kirtland, her level of trust was pretty good, because she had a lot of friends there, the thing about living in Kirtland with the early saints was they were heavily bonded because society had rejected them. So when you came into their midst and became a member of the church, you had a family unit there that supported one another. Emma was very close to many of the sisters who lived there. And as a result, she she counted on them and there was that camaraderie of sisterly friendship that they had. But there were many times when some of them went to Missouri ahead of her and they left as friends, but then she gets to Missouri and finds out some of them that she had been friends with are now part of the persecution process. They've been excommunicated. They sworn out affidavits against her husband, putting him in danger, putting the whole family in, in danger. This happened over and over and over again. And then when you think about the government and how they had been treated by the government and then just the mob, you can see how little by little she starts losing the ability to trust pe- people very easily. Um, the great losses that they had in Missouri were very heavy for her and having to leave with her husband in jail was a tremendous thing for her to have to go through fleeing in, in the night, crossing the frozen Mississippi. She was carrying my, my great grandfather, who was just a baby at the time and, um, had children holding onto her skirt. So you can imagine the, the fear. So by the time she gets into Illinois and Joseph comes home, uh, he's like the only person that she really trusts altogether. But then he dies, and then there's dividing lines that are drawn uh, because of the the turmoil that followed his death. Um, Some of the dividing lines that happened um, was Joseph's belongings. So Emma, as a widow, felt like anything that belonged to him uh, was hers as a widow's right. And so I understand that, and she's right. Uh, but there was also the brethren who needed things that he had been working on as a prophet, one of them being the uh, inspired translation that he'd been working on. Mm. And this is something Emma had been trusted to watch over uh, crossing the Mississippi. She had it sewn up into her skirts, and she was very loyal to guarding these sacred documents. She wasn't about to give them up to anybody. She didn't trust anybody at this point. And so she was concerned about about you know why they were wanting it. Also, just to backtrack a bit, you have any time a prophet is working on something and he dies and it's for the church, it goes with the church. So that was Brigham Stan that should go to the church and he was right. So you had two people that were actually right, but they conflicted with one another. So it was a very hard situation. And this is where we start to see some of the um, trouble starting between the relationship of, of Brigham Young and uh, Emma Smith. Emma and the children began to feel isolated. Joseph Smith III later recalls that he felt as if they were being watched and their lives were in danger. This is because Brigham Young had set up men to guard the home 
because the mob had been threatening to come in and kill the, the, child, the sons of Joseph as well, because they wanted the whole family gone. So he went, he wanted to protect them. Unfortunately, some of the men who were posted wasn't too kind to Emma, uh, and they would not let any of their friends come into the house or visit to the, visit them. So Joseph, as a child, is seeing this as the perspective of Brigham Young and Sidney's man to watch over us and, and, and or uh, separate us from our friends, isolate us, and that's kind of what set in his mind. Um, and so I don't, honestly, after everything I've read, I don't believe that's how it happened. I just think some of the men had their own personal agendas and did not like Emma at the time because of some of the choices she was making. But by the way, that's why you're saying it. So these stories come down into my generation that Brigham Young constantly had bully Emma, sorry, Emma bully, and um, was, was hard on the family. So as youths, if, we, we heard a lot of bad things about Brigham Young. If there's any descendants in here of Brigham Young, it, there's a happy ending coming. And, but um, there's also the estate issue because Joseph had not left the will, so it was hard to determine what was his personally and what belonged to the church. Uh, this became a huge issue for the state and for the, or the, the brethren because uh, the last two years of his life, he had found out that in Illinois, you can't own more than 10 acres if you're a church organization, and he had thousands. So he was trying to um, take some of these properties and deed them off to church members, still still to be used for the church. So there were properties in Emma's name and Hiram name, Hiram's name, and, and many, many others. And this this became so hard to, to figure out. The, the whole estate issue, to settle it, took 10 years. A lot of people lost all the land that they owned as a result. Um, there's a really good article written by Dell and H. Jones called Joseph Smith in the Wake of the Steamboat Nauvoo, and it tells the whole history of the estate issue, and it's fascinating. It's It starts out with a purchase from Latter-day Saint members of a steamboat from Robert E. Lee, who was doing engineer work along the Mississippi River, and when he was done, he sold off the surplus. Well, the church members were like, let's buy this boat, and we can use it to take supplies from St. Louis down to the Red Brick store. And uh, unfortunately, the people they hired to run it ran it aground right off, and it was damaged, and they couldn't use it, and they couldn't afford to fix it. And then Joseph and Hiram were killed, and all of a sudden, here come the government knocking on the door for $25,000. And so that was just that debt alone. There was a lot more. So it takes 10 years to settle this debt. Emma's facing the loss of all of her properties because it's, they're being set to be auctioned off. So she's worried about if anyone's going to take care of her because everything that she's seeing around her doesn't look like anyone's looking after her in interests. And she's very sensitive on that issue because of all the things that's happened in the past. So she goes to... Uh, Carthage files to be administrator of the estate, but she didn't have the money to pay the stipend that could get her that appointment. So someone else was assigned. And um, fortunately, unfortunately, she only got $124 a year to live on until the estate was settled. So when all was said and done, she got $1,500, which was a lot of money back then, but she had to turn around and use that to pay off all the debts. And then she had she was left with some of the church debt to deal with as well. And she, it took her until six years before she died to pay everything off, but she did. And so it was very hard. And it was during this process, Brigham Young is, is getting more and more upset because in his mind, let us take care of it. You know, we'll take care of it. But in her mind, no one's going to look after her. Her husband's gone. And he's the one that always looked after her. And so it was just, it just kept getting worse. The division, the gap kept getting wider and wider. There are also media issues that Emma had to deal with. When you were dealing in the past, just like today, with controversial people in the public eye, there's always um, outstanding weird stories written about them and put in the papers. Emma, after Joseph's death, had to deal with that a lot. There were a lot of things written. This is just one of them. It was New York Sun, 1845, December issue. And it's a letter that she was supposed to have written saying, I left here, sir with a family of children to attend to without any means of giving them an education for there's not a school in the city. I must now say that I have never for a moment believed in what my husband called his apparitions and revelations 
as I thought him laboring under a diseased mind. Well, you can, you can imagine how this spread. And it went all over the place. It even got down in the Nauvoo area. It was in the neighboring counties. There were people, the Latter-day Saints were still in Nauvoo. Some of them believed that Emma had written this and she was losing her testimony and rejecting everything. John Taylor writes a uh, something has put in the paper that he, he doesn't believe Emma wrote this. And she would never have, have said anything like that about her husband. And uh, so she did have friends standing by her. But unfortunately, there were those who went west thinking that she had lost her testimony. She heard about this letter and she wrote to the editor saying, I wish to inform you and the public through your paper that the letter published Tuesday morning, December 9th, is a forgery, the whole of it. And I hope that this notice will put a stop to all such communications. Well, by then it was too late. It had already done the damage. And so that was just one of, and I just touched on a few things. There are a lot of things that happened, but, um, Emma remained in Nauvoo. Uh, the mob warned all the riverboat pilots not to help any of the Mormons escape, but they had a really good friend uh, who had a steamboat called the Uncle Toby. And he snuck in and told the family what was going on. And he got them on his boat, took them up river to Fulton for six months. That's where she stayed. And she came back because she heard that uh, the man that she had rented her mansion house to, Van Toyle, was planning on loading up all of her belongings and taking off with it. So she gets all of her kids together and uh, they start heading back. And this is uh, when she is quoted as saying, I have no friend but God and no place to go but home. And that in the Nauvoo becomes her home from that moment on. Um, so one of the biggest questions I get asked is why did Emma stay in Nauvoo? Uh, I remember wondering that myself when I visited the first few times and it always went back to I just think she wanted to be buried with her family. And as I did research, I came across uh, something that Buddy Young Green found. It was a quote where Emma said, I know the Latter-day Saints out west do not believe I am a good Latter-day Saint for not going, but I knew my lot if I stayed. I did not know my lot if I went. The Lord knows I have suffered until I've suffered enough. My husband is buried here. My children are buried here. I want to be buried here. And so that just kind of resonated with what I had already felt. Anyway, <clears throat> and we all know that Joseph wanted a tomb built for him and his family because he wanted to rise with them in the res during the resurrection. And um, so, it, you know, it was good for her to stay and, and fulfill that wish of his. They had had their temple blessings. They were sealed to one another. There wasn't anything wrong for her saying, saying. And we as a family have found a lot of good in her staying behind. Uh, we know that if she hadn't stayed behind, Joseph Smith III would not have become president of the reorganized church. What that did for uh, for all of us is uh, him as president held all those lands in Ohio, Missouri together. If that hadn't have happened, they would have all been divided and sold off. The thousands of people who didn't have a care at all for our church history. Um, but they've been preserving it all this time. Little by little, the churches have been buying some of it back. And that will keep happening as the Lord wants it to. But until then, we have, there's people who care about it that are they're preserving it. And so we're really happy about that. It really taught me, I don't know all the Lord's errands and, and everything. So I'm glad that she stayed in Nauvoo. We've got many properties there because of her. Yeah. And uh, so I think it's just amazing. And this is a picture I like to leave everybody with, the impression of Joseph and Emma I like to leave uh, when, I, when I'm finished talking about this period in their lives. Because when all is said and done, they were human beings. They were family. They loved one another. Joseph loved his family so much. He loved everyone. He had the pure love of Christ uh, so much. And he wanted everybody to have that. That's, that's one of the things he worked on. Uh, during his ministry here, was trying to teach people the importance of loving one another, loving the Savior, and having a deep relationship with the Savior. So that's the, that's the image I like to leave everyone with. That's a painting by Janet Rogers. So I'm going to do a little intermission with some music. Um, I usually sing it, but my son's not here right now. So I'm going to play you a video. And this is uh, a piece that my son and I wrote about Joseph and Emma. It's about Lucy Mack Smith, a mother who's lost her son. Um, Emma Smith, a wife who's lost her husband, David Hiram Smith, a son that lost the father he never knew, and the generations today, um, 
we got permission to use footage from the Emma Smith My Story movie to make this video, and it's called Serenity Blue. Gentle mother kind Have you lost your sons? Deep within your mind You know their work has just begun
Something I like to tell people when I do my firesides is something that I learned a long time ago, and that's the adversary knows our missions. He knows why we're here. He knows the, the missions we came here to do, and he looks for any door to open that he can throw stumbling blocks in front of. And it happens especially all, to all of us, but especially when we're young and we go through tra traumatic things. Uh, that's that voice that comes into our heads and, and tells us that we're different now, we're no good, we're dumb, we're stupid, we're ugly, whatever it is, makes us <laughs> inadequate. And um, and the first thing we usually give up on is our talents because we have this feeling that we're not good enough to do these things. And so that's why he hits us because our talents is what we've been given, our gifts to uplift the people and help bring them together. And um, so I'll, I'll share how I learned that in a little bit. But <clears throat> I was born on August 7th, 1962 in Maryville, Tennessee, they'll say Maryville. They say Maryville. And if you've ever been to Pigeon Forge in Gatlinburg, my fifth great grandmother was the first settler with her sons in, in those areas. And um, so I was a sixth generation Tennessean born there. Um, my mom's parents were Ray and Bess Roberts, and um, my papa, they both had Cherokee lineage, but my papa had more. He was a very visionary man. He had many visions um, about the Lord, about the gospel. Uh, he was always searching for more. He'd be in one church for a while and go to another and get all the pit and that one and go to that. He just searched his whole life for more truth. Um, my mama was also spiritual, but she was also schizophrenic, and they didn't know what that was back then. It's just that when she would go off, you know, they'd have a saying, that she's a bit ticked. You know, that's how they would say it. But she could be very violent when she was like that. And my mother is the one who bore the brunt of her violence, and she was beaten throughout her childhood as a result. <clears throat> and so as my mom got older, she talked a little bit more about some of the things that happened. And she said she remembered being in bed one night and she heard the doorknob jiggle. And um, she said when she opened her eyes, her mother was standing over her with a butcher knife. So she learned to, if she heard her mother's footsteps, she would get under the bed. Um, and so there's just a lot of things that happened, but here's the kind of spirit my mom had. She was very, uh, she loved Jesus so much that she would never do anything to uh, disappoint him. And even at a young age, she she had that feeling of just always wanting to 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 walk a straight path. And Mama always threatened her with a pistol. She she would always say, "I'm gonna get my pistol and I'm gonna kill you." <laughs> and Mama was terrified of that because she knew she would make good if she got if she was in one of her spells and that gun was there that she would make gun on it. At eight years old. Uh, she she was aware of this kind of thing. And so one day my mama and papa were gone and my mom looked all over the house for that uh, pistol. She found it and she went out in the backyard and buried it. And, and here's the kind of spirit my mom had. Uh, after she buried the gun, she got down on her knees and she asked Jesus to forgive her for stealing her mama's gun. <laughs> and um, she was just, uh, and Sherry's the only one in this room that, that knew my mom. And um, she had a pure life, the love of Christ like no one I've ever known. So, such a beautiful soul. But she had a very low self-esteem. She was asking herself questions. What's wrong with me? What do I need to be do to change? Why doesn't my mother love me? Uh, because the adversary wants us to think we're the ones with the problem. And, and so she had no counseling. Back then, they didn't do that kind of thing. And she just had to deal with this. And... Um, but because of her father's teachings of the Savior and of the, the pure love of Christ, and she had a background of a foundation to build on. And so that's who she turned to all the time, was to Jesus. She would sit on her bed and she'd talk to him like, like he was her best friend. And she said she could remember feeling that comfort there. She knew he was there listening to her. And that's how she got through those years. Uh, and so then when she's 19, she met my father. They fell in love decided to get married and my mom's thought process was okay here here's my chance to have a nice home full of kids a happy family with no trauma <clears throat> but what my mom didn't understand is if you want to escape trauma you don't marry the smith family because mm -hmm. it just falls everywhere so 
that that's something she learned when she first met her soon to be in laws. So my mom's uh, my father's mother and all of his sisters. Uh, my mom learned soon, just right after meeting them, that they could not stand her. And this isn't a woman coming out of years of abuse without counseling, uh, just perceiving these people don't like me. They hated my mother and they treated her horribly. Um, and I, I learned this in my later years, but my brother was older than me and he's, he saw a lot of this happen. And so I did, I, what I come to learn in my older years was my mom's spirit was so good. And she was a beautiful woman. She was very slender and she was so good hearted that it, it created a hate within them because they had bad spirits with them. They, they had that bitterness and that thing, whatever you call it, passed down for generations. Uh, and it just brought out that in them. And so that it caused them to be that way. This is one reason my brother doesn't follow any religion, religion because my dad's people were supposed to be these good spiritual people and they did that to my to my mom and so it kind of caused him to just step back so that's what my mom walked into and there she was starting to say again what's wrong with me why don't these people like me so she says to my father can we not live in missouri around your people because i don't know if i can handle this or not and he said i didn't plan on living in missouri and then proceeded to move 40 times before i was 12 and my dad's the kind of person, and I don't want to make him sound bad because I love my dad, but he's he's brilliant in so many areas that he can't just settle on one thing. And so he'd go and start down one road, and he'd decide that one for him, and he'd either quit or he'd get fired. So we'd get a, a home, and we'd get settled, and after about six months to a year, we'd lose everything and be destitute. And it happened over and over and over again. And we always had to go live with family, and guess who we went to live with? his family. And that caused my mom to have three nervous breakdowns because they were all blaming her because like, she wanted to move all the time when it was actually him. And so during the third breakdown, uh, she weighed 98 pounds. I was three years old and she was in bed because she couldn't do a lot. And, but she was praying a lot about how to overcome what she was going through. And one day she got very specific about her prayer. She said, what do I need to do to overcome this? And she heard a voice tell her, you need to raise your children not to have the hatred that your husband's family has. And so we became my mom's focus. And she focused on teaching us all about the Savior and the Holy Ghost and about uh, all the foundational teachings and the atonement. We knew these things growing up at a young age. And the thing about mountain people, like Tennessee, Southern mountain people, they, when it comes to the spirit, you you follow it, you know, in that right, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> you you follow it no matter what. If, if it doesn't make sense, if it looks scary, it doesn't matter. Just go. It'll make sense later. It won't be scary. And and that's what we learned that from our mom. So I learned uh, from my mother that the Holy Ghost trumps everything. So it doesn't matter what you read. Doesn't matter what you hear from other people. If the spirit's leading you somewhere. You, you go and you stick to that. So that's uh, that's what she drew her life into. And so that's why we had the teachings that we did. Um, so as we're traveling around, my father was playing bluegrass. He's on the top right. And uh, I, didn't get, I didn't get to mention that music is just like heavy in the Smith family from Joseph and Emma. Emma had a high soprano voice, sing beautifully. Um, their children wrote music. Uh, my grandpa was in music. My father was in bluegrass music most of his, of his life. And on my mama's side, Dolly Parton's my third cousin. So that's why there's a mountain influence in a lot of the music that we do. So dad took me and my sister into, uh, he took my sister in one room and taught her lead. And when I was five, he took me in a room and taught me harmony. And we came together and sang I'll Fly Away in one take. And it was just it was beautiful. Like the harmony was like, and even at five, I was like, I want to keep doing this. And so we would perform for years with my dad on stage uh, singing songs. And I loved it because people would tap their feet. They'd be happy. They'd be singing with us. I was like, I just want to do this the rest of my life. And that's how music is. Isn't it, Jimmy? Yes. <laughs> and so that was my dream. I just wanted to sing. And so we were living in Hubbard, Oregon when I was around nine years old. And there was a neighbor who lived down the road from me that abused me in the worst way. The little girl can be abused. And it caused me to shut down. 
So the two things I swore I would never do again. Remember I said the adversary knows our mission. I swore I would never get up in front of people and sing. And I would never get in front of people or a crowd to do anything. And it was so terrifying that I refused to do oral reports in high school. I'd take zeros instead. I wouldn't get involved in anything. So what are the things that I do now? I get up in front of people. I think my biggest crowd is 3,000. I get up in front of people and sing. And I get up in front of people and teach about the importance of finding that balance of uh, uh, loving one another, forgiving one another, uniting our families, gathering together. I don't think the adversary wanted that to happen. So he, that's what happened to me when I was young. He attacked me and I had those things in my head. I'm stupid. I'm ugly. I'm dumb. I'm not good enough to do that. Those were the things in my head. And so, and that was my reaction to them. And so that's why, especially to the youth, I like to say, the adversary knows. So when things happen to you, you don't give up on your talents. You know, even if you feel inadequate, push through and keep going. So while I was shut up in my room at the age of nine, going on 10 and not going out because I was just, you know, I just wanted to be by myself and withdrawn. I was listening to music and my favorites were the Osmonds, the Bee Gees and the Carpenters. And they had these really unique voices that I could harmonize with. I didn't know at the time that that was helping me heal too. And um, if I was, if I knew anything about my life at this moment, at, at nine to ten, it was that I was going to marry Donny Austin. <laughs> <laughs> that was on my bucket list. And then uh, when I was twelve, the Osmonds came out with their album called "The Plan," which is a pop variation of "The Plan of Salvation." I don't think I need to tell anybody in this room what an album is, but when you sometimes you could open them. And there would be things on the inside like lyrics. Well, this had a picture that I I could only describe at the time as stages of life. So you come down to earth, you get born, you marry, you have kids, and then you go you go back, you go to heaven. And because I didn't, so I I didn't know what a Mormon was. I didn't know anything about plan of salvation. I didn't know who Joseph Smith was. That was my dad's name. I had no idea. And uh, I just knew that when I listened to this music, that the spirit was really, really strong. And so I was like, oh, man, this is a puppy loving one bad apple. This is, <laughs> where did you come from? Where are you, uh, where are you here? And where are you going when you leave this place? And it was very, uh, it just drew me in. And my dad didn't like the Osmonds because their hair touched their collar. That made them hippies. <laughs> and to me, I grew up in that age. The hippies had hair down here, but for him, it was touching the collar. And so I asked him one day, I said, Dad, why don't you like the Osmonds? And his his whole countenance changed. He said, because they're Mormons. When he said it, his whole countenance changed. <clears throat> Even the look in his eye was different. And I just I was like, oh, wow, this isn't a good thing, because I know what a good spirit feels like, and I know what a bad one feels like. And for some reason, these People brought this out of my dad, so this must not be good. So I was like, I can't listen to this anymore. That lasted about five minutes because of Donnie's in it. It was good, <laughs> right? So I thought, okay, here's how I'll compromise. I'll listen to the music. I just want anything to do with people called Mormons. And I didn't know what that was. I just thought it was a bad thing. So that was that was my plan. That's what I went off of uh, for a little while. And it's interesting because we have this pattern of things that, that happen you know, with um, my mom focusing on teaching his foundational teachings of the Savior, the Atonement, pure love of Christ, and the Holy Ghost, and then the abuse that happened to me, and then I'm introduced to this album, and then two months later, we go to visit my grandma Smith in Missouri, and I walk into her little foyer in the log cabin, and there was these two portraits hanging up there. Now, here's the value of what my mom taught me about the Holy Ghost. Anytime you come across people or things and the spirit is really, really strong at that moment, you're being led somewhere. So you need to learn as much as you can about those people or things. And so I just knew right away that they felt familiar to me. Uh, I felt like I'd seen them before, and especially the man, I was very drawn to him. And um, there's the spirit was just so strong. And so I thought, okay, I need to find out. So I said, Grandma, who are these people in these portraits? And she said, that's Joseph and Emma Smith, your second great grandparents. He's the one that started the church. She was referring to Church of Christ Temple Lot, which my grandfather was an apostle and secretary in. So, Church of Christ Temple Lot was formed around 1862 by Grandpa Hedrick. It's a it's an early break off, but they don't consider themselves a break off. They consider themselves the original, and say so they own the, the Temple Lot in Independence. 
Uh, I had no idea what she was talking about because I knew nothing. I only knew about my mom's um, beliefs. And then I went, so I went to ask my dad questions and that opened the door to all these things about Brigham Young. When I was 13, like about a year later, we moved to Ava, Missouri and started going to the Temple Lot Church, which was mostly my dad's family. And so we'd have the family dinner once a month, and this is where I heard all the stuff. Brigham Young had Joseph Hyam and Samuel killed. Um, if you're a descendant and you go out west, you'll get killed. There's a conspiracy to wipe us all out. If you're a woman and you try to leave the church, they'll take you up to the top of the Salt Lake Temple and push you into the Salt Lake. Did I believe it? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I, I was very geographically challenged. <laughs> it didn't help that we had a book in our house that the artist's rendering of Salt Lake uh, had everything that had to do with Salt Lake right up by the temple, including the lake. So I really did believe that. <laughs> that would prove to be very embarrassing later. Uh, but those were really scary things to hear, you know. And these are one of those rumor things that grew as the generations went because the one about Brigham Young having Joseph Hyman and Samuel murder, murdered came from an article that William Smith, Joseph's brother, wrote in which he accused Brigham Young and Willard Richards of poisoning Samuel, and that's how he died. And so by the time it gets to my generation, it's grown into Joseph Hiram and Samuel. Uh, we all know now that Samuel Smith died on the way to, uh, well, he was on his way to visit his brother, his brothers in Carthage, and he was spotted by the mob, and he was chased on horseback, and he rode so long and hard that it caused an injury in his side that became septic, and that's how he died a few weeks later. And then there's this rumor <laughs> that went down to the generations. Uh, so there I was. I just wanted to know more and more about this, this man and his wife who I felt very connected to. And I had all these feelings for. I was a teenager at the time. And I was getting all this bad stuff. And it didn't correlate with the spirit I felt when I, when I was around these pictures. So I decided to shelf it all. And the only thing, you know, we didn't have the internet back then. And thank goodness I would have... I've been introduced to a lot of time, time, which would have made things even worse. But my grandpa had a trunk full of old things. Which were, I didn't know what they were at the time, but there were 10 types of the family in there, just all kind of stuff. And there was a small pamphlet called Joseph Smith Tells His Own Story. And that's the only thing I had to, to, to look at. And so I was reading it. And basically what I was reading was his conversion story. I just didn't know if that's what it really was. But... I believed everything it said, and uh, and I knew that much about him then. My grandpa did have a Book of Mormon. Um, it was a Temple Lot version, and the only difference is they're not broken down into verses. They're in their original format. And it was sitting on his real top desk. Um, it had gone to my dad because he had passed away in 65. And I remember picking it up and just flipping through it, and then I put it back down, and I put my hand on it, and when I put my hand on it, something went all through me and it was confirmed to me that that was a divine book and that Joseph had translated and it was from God. Before I had even read it, I had a testimony of the Book of Mormon. And so those are the two things that I was exposed to as a teenager, but I had no answers to my questions. So that went on until I just shelved it. Uh, it was always in my mind. And then when I was a young adult, I started having an interest in genealogy. We had a very small library in Ava, Missouri, and at the time they didn't have a lot in, in their reference section. So I asked the librarian, I said, is there anywhere I can go where I can get more information on my genealogy? Well, up to that point, I'd already been taught by my dad, don't ever tell anyone you're descendant of Joseph Smith. It just brings persecution and problems. Don't ever uh, talk to, to missionaries. They're trained very well in how to hook you, and if you're not careful, you get snuckered. I knew I could get snuckered at the drop of a hat because I just wanted to be everybody's friend. So I was like, I just won't talk to him. That way I won't get hooked. You know? And so I'm asking this librarian, and she said, yeah, there's a family history center in Springfield that was about 60 miles from us. I said, okay, family history, it sounds great. She's writing down the address. She said, now you have to go into a church to get there. It's uh, in the LDS church. I said, okay, what's that? She said, the Mormon church. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I didn't say it to her, but in my head, like, I'm not walking in those doors. And, but then I got to my car, I was so frustrated because it's the only place I could go to get what I wanted. So I thought, well, here's my plan. I'm gonna walk into that family history center and act like I know what I'm doing, get what I need and leave. But what I didn't count on was the missionaries being there and they could spot non members 50 miles away. <laughs> and I was fair game. 
And I walk in, this really neat lady comes up to me and she introduced herself and she said, um, are you here to work on family history? I said, yeah. She said, do you know how to use the computers? I lied, said, yeah. She said, well, just sit down and help yourself. I said, okay. So I turned on the computer. Well, the computers were, it was when it was like a blue screen and a little square, it said, yellow square, it said, enter here. And then it come all this list of IGIs and CDs and things like that. And I was like, no, no idea what I'm doing. Well, her husband was sitting in the back of the room watching. And this is where I learned that missionaries work in pairs. <laughs> he knew I didn't know what I was doing. So he comes up and he sits down. He said, can I help you get started? I said, well, sure. He said, well, I'll tell you, um, let's just take a name all the way through. I'll show you how it's done. What's the farthest name you've got back? Said, oh, man, can't tell him that. So he said, I need a surname. He's, and I said, well, you know, Smith's a common name. What's he going to say? So I said, Smith. And he said, well, what's the given name? I thought, well, I can't tell him that. But then Joseph's a common name, too. Maybe he won't notice. Did he notice? He didn't say anything. And I, he said, what's the birthday? And I said, December 3rd, uh, 23rd, no, five. He said, really now? <laughs> That'd be Joseph the prophet? Well, I had to stop. I had never heard. Joseph the prophet before I heard fallen prophet because that's what my dad believed in his that, that church believed he was a fallen prophet or, or, the, or the rest was just negative or he wasn't talked about at all and so they started asking me all these questions I did not have the answers to because I didn't know my heritage or history and then they started talking about their um, testimonies of him and how much they loved him and how much they loved Emma and there was just all this love was just pouring out and the Holy Ghost was so strong and it's the first time I'd ever felt felt the spirit like I did when I saw the portraits. You know? So I was very confused because when you when you grow up around your family, they tell you things, they know what they're talking about, right? I mean, that's what you think in your head. You know, and I'm getting out of the car, my dad has told me all these things about these people. And I was like, man, you know, the Holy Ghost was so strong. And then I was like, wait a minute, oh man. They are good. They, they were that close. They almost had me. <laughs> and, but I was like, okay, so here's how I work this one out. I could keep going back to the Family History Center because the Holy Ghost was there. The church is still evil. The Holy Ghost was in that room. So I kept going back. And that's where I, I learned about Nauvoo. And the first time I started reading about it, something said, you, you need to go. And I was like, okay. So I knew by then, the Spirit says to go, you go. So when I was... My son was three. Uh, this is him with my sister in the women's garden. And um, we took our first trip to Nauvoo, and I had very little knowledge to go on besides what I'd read in that pamphlet and just a few things I'd heard. But I wanted to, and everything was closed when we got there, so I wanted to at least walk down to the graves at the homestead. And so I noticed as I walked down, there was a, I could feel a lot of family around me and but it felt very sad there was like a heaviness that kept getting worse as i walked down and, and here are the graves and i'm looking at them i'm looking at the mountain house and the mansion house and the homestead and the river and then my eyes went back on those names again and i just broke down crying and the only thing i could describe it as at that point was it was very very heavy very very sad and very unsettled so we went the next day, we toured the homes, which was a completely different fam uh, feeling because you felt family there, but it felt really good. And um, the end of the tour, the lady took us out and she said, now there are other homes you can go look at and LDS missionaries can take you through those homes. I was like, oh man, missionaries can't get away from those guys. <laughs> but I knew I had to go because I was a history buff and I wanted to go through these homes. So Heber C. Kendall was like my favorite home that I went through. And the woman that took me through, I love her so much, she could have been my grandma. And she bore her testimony of the Savior, of the Book of Mormon, and of Joseph when she was finished. And there again was the Holy Ghost that was so strong. And I walked out of that house knowing that I was going to have to keep coming back to learn about my heritage and my history. And I needed to learn from these people because that's where the Holy Ghost was. Because like my mom said and taught me, the Holy Ghost trumps everything. And that's where you have to go with that. So I did. For like the next six years, I was taking these trips to Nauvoo, learning all that I could. It's actually where I met Sherry Saint. And through her sister, her sister's husband was my first bishop. But I met her later. It wasn't during this time. But just going to Nauvoo off and on throughout the years, um, I met Sherry, and, and uh, we became very, very good friends. 
And the impact of those trips was that I, I learned more and more about who Joseph was. And what was so interesting about that was the more I came to know Joseph, the more I feel like I already knew him. And I, I, it just all felt familiar in here. And he just seemed like this presence that had been around me since I was a little girl. And my mom used to tell me, you know, we all have, we all have um, guardian angels and that they're family members. And I really do believe that he was mine because of the connection that I feel with him. Um, and so while I'm taking these trips back and forth in Abu, um, we lived near Branson, Missouri, and we would often go to Silver Dollar City. Uh, we call it still your Dollar City because we've been broke, but you have fun. <laughs> and so one of the things about back then being in Branson is that they had the Branson Strip, and they didn't have relief highways back then. So when the theaters would let out, it was just like jam-packed, and you barely moved and got stalled all the time. So we, nine times out of ten, always got stalled in front of the Osmond Family Theater. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm looking at the sign whenever we'd be paused there. I just look at, look at the sign and see the names up there. Wouldn't it be fun to see, you know, see them after all these years? And, and that they, we had heard that they'd come out later and talk to their fans and stuff. And how fun would that be? Uh, but I kept procrastinating. And sometimes I felt prompted to go. And I just kept procrastinating. I think the Lord got tired after six years of waiting. We want tickets to see the show from a radio show. <laughs> and uh, so what was going on during all this time, though, was in the beginning, it was Alan Wayne, and Jay and Jimmy who were performing. Meryl was out in Utah. And at one point, he, he had been asked by the brothers to come out, but he didn't want to be a part of that. That wasn't anything on his radar. But he was he had a vision that he's given me permission to share and in this vision, Joseph took him into a building, and there were all these rooms that were separated by curtains, and he pulled one curtain back, and uh, Meryl said there was just a sea of faces, and they were all miserable, and Joseph said to him, this is my posterity, would you please help them? Mm -hmm. So he went, and it's so profound and so affected him that he went to the prophet and talked to him about it, and the prophet said, well, my boy... I think you need to move to Missouri and make friends. <laughs> well, that was not on his radar. He had heard about his nephews and how much trouble they had had in school getting bullied, not because they were just Mormons, but they were also Osmonds, so they were double targets. And, and it becomes serious at times. But um, Alan came down with MS, so Jimmy called Merrill and asked him to come and take his place. And so he felt like he should do that. So when I went to the show, Merrill was there. He was singing uh, How Great Thou Art for the intermission, uh, intermission song. And um, the spirit was like, you need to talk to this man. I was like, okay. <laughs> I don't know what that's all about, but I'll just you know, I'll just meet all the brothers afterwards. They always come out and we'll just see where this goes. And so after the show, the brothers came out, along with Seth Merrill came out. And so I was talking to each one of them and just kind of went on down the line. And me and the kids waited until almost everybody was gone. And I, I told the kids, I said, well, let's, let's just go. And I heard someone behind me as we were walking up the aisle, and I turned around, and it was him. And so I was walking down the aisle. Something said, tell him who you are. And I was like, no, 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 because we're not supposed to say anything. It's just like, no, you need to tell him who you are. And so um, I introduced myself and told him that how much I love this show. And I said, you know, I've seen your My Beliefs page. And how much you love Joseph Smith. He said, yes. So are you a member of the church? I said, no, I just wanted to know he was my second great grandfather. And he said, oh, I need to talk to you. <laughs> and that's how I became friends with Meryl and by extension, extension the whole Osmond family, especially their mom, who got a good kick out of some of the stuff I've been told. And uh, she, had, she had a lot, a lot of long spiritual discussions with me. And little by little, uh, I began to trust that they would be honest with me. And I, th I think, honestly, God thought if I was ever going to get into this church, it would be through one of those boys. <laughs> <laughs> but I told Meryl, I said, you know, I would love to take the discussions, but I don't want to do it in Haba. There's too many family members there. He said, well, come down to the show once a week and come to my house afterwards. We'll, we'll eat. The sisters can come over and teach you. And so that's what we did. And during the third discussion, um, the spirit was like, you need to be baptized. Like just, just, I don't even remember what the third discussion was, but in the midst of it, that's what came to me. And I was like, oh, no, no, you need to be baptized. And I, I kind of wanted to, but there was all this what abouts and what ifs, you know, and 
fear of the family and all that stuff. And so I told Mal, I said, you know, I know I'm supposed to be baptized. Of course, he was excited, and so were the sisters. And I had a 50-mile drive home to think about this. And that's when all the what ifs and what abouts came out about polygamy, about bat- baptism for the dead, about all these things that we've been told. You know, what about all of those things? I had this massive headache when I got home, and I laid down on the bed, and the first thing that came to me was the Holy Ghost trumps everything. So I had to push all that aside because I, I couldn't deal with it. If this is where the Spirit was telling me to go, I needed to go that way. So I was baptized June 7th, 1998. Merrill came up to Avon on his only day off on a Sunday and uh, baptized and confirmed me a member of the church. My son was the only member of my family there because no one else knew about it. So I kept it secret for a couple of months because I just didn't want anything interfering with this. It was it was made known to me that this was an urgency and this needed to happen. And so I didn't want anything getting in the way. And it was one of the few times that I, a person was baptized without the husband's permission because my husband did not know about it. And because I knew that would that stop to do it. So uh, I told my mom first, and she said, well, was it the spirit that led you there? I said, yeah. She said, well, you did the right thing. What are you going to tell your dad? I said, well, I thought I'd send him an email because I don't want to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> of course I did. And of course he was devastated, you know. Um, but he's, he's, he still loves me. He's kind of like this, he's afraid I'm going to hell, but he still loves me type of thing. And... Um, my dad has a lot of flaws, but let me tell you, he's an amazing person. He's a good person, too. And he knows ancient scripture like no no one I've ever met. And if you ever want to hear anyone talk Isaiah, you want to hear my father talk Isaiah, because he's really good about applying it to these times. Um, but it, it was hard on him. Uh, but throughout the years, he softened. He, he respected my kids a lot, and he knew the church is what made them what they were. And... Um, so within a few years, my children both joined the church, my sister, and then eventually my mom joined the church, and she became a calming influence in the home. Uh, of course, dad, dad couldn't help it because we kept having missionaries over all the time. And one Thanksgiving, we had 14 missionaries in their little apartment, and he had a ball because no matter where they said they were from, he'd live there. And so he could, <laughs> and then go out. The last person was out the door, and he'd say, "Oh, sure, love those boys. It's just too bad they teach the wrong thing." <laughs> but the important thing is, he didn't have the bitterness and hatred in his heart towards the Latter Day Saint people. He was, he was in a state of love now. He just didn't agree, and that's that's where we want people. You know, where it goes from there, that's where the Lord steps in, and and He takes it where it needs to go, um, and so. There we go. My dad's uh, in a good good place when it comes to the church. He just still doesn't agree. Um, so I promised a good, happy ending for Brigham Young's concerns. So I have to tell you the story. This is how I overcame Brigham Young. So immediately after, uh, I think it was the second Sunday after I got baptized, I went to Relief Society for the first time. Guess who they were studying in the manual that we <laughs> So this the woman, this, this woman got up because she saw me come in and she handed me a book and it's Brigham Young on the front. And listen, I've never hated anybody in my life except him because of how it was ground into us, the kind of things that he did and all these terrible things that just over and over and over again. And here was this ancestor I loved so much. And um so yeah, there was there was some hatred there. It's, it's so much if I saw a picture of him or I heard his name, I was going. <laughs> so she handed me the book. She turned around, sat down. I left. I swore I wouldn't go back until I were done with that book. That was so not like me. But I, I would go to sacrament. So when it came time for me to go to the temple, ours was St. Louis, and I started asking everybody, "What's your favorite temple?" Because I felt like I was supposed to go somewhere else, and I didn't know why. So everybody was talking about their favorite temple. And then one day this lady said, Manti. And as soon as she said it, it just clicked. I said, Manti, that's where I'm supposed to go. Where's it at? She said, it's in Utah. I was like, okay, go to Utah. That's a scary place. Um, but I knew I was supposed to go. Two days before we left, we had missionaries in our front seat. Um, well, one was in the front. We had one in the back. And my son was in the back, and I was driving. And I was taking him home from his own conference. And I'm just driving along, and Elder Woods, who's sitting up front with me, said, so, Sister Smith, are you going to be in Utah for a few weeks? What are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to go through the endowment, 
I'm going to meet some family I've never met before and do some sightseeing. And he just busts in and said, you'll learn all about Brigham Young. And I was driving, my hands just tightened around the wheel. And I said, no, why? And he was the type, type of missionary that when the Lord would work with him, his countenance would change. And so he got really quiet. And I looked over and I went, oh, man. <laughs> the Lord's working with him. That means I got to listen. So I said, all right, Elder Woods, what's on your mind? And he said, uh, started talking about his um, feelings towards Joseph Smith, and he bore his testimony of the Savior and of Joseph and of Brigham Young. And by the time we got to Brigham Young, I didn't have any defenses left. And everything just shifted in that car. And we came up to a signal light that turned red. And I put on the brake, and everything I'd ever felt against this man was just pulled out. And it was so overpowering, I had to take in a breath. And it's the first, I believe in the healing power of the pure love of Christ. I'd seen it before, but I'd never experienced it before, where the Lord would take something if you're willing to let it go, and you don't feel it at all anymore, and he replaces it with peace. And so when I dropped uh, the elders off, I told the elder, you know, this big empty space where all that hatred was, you bet. I'll learn as much as I can about Brigham Young. So while we were in Salt Lake City, and I was dumb enough to ask, where's the lake? And we're standing by the temple. <laughs> um, I think somebody said, you can smell it, but you can't see it. And um, we were just walking around to different places, and we came across Brigham Young's grave. So I told everybody, if you give me a few moments, because I'd already dealt with everything. I just, I wanted to say something to him. So I knelt down, and I asked him to forgive me for perpetuating the hatred against his, his name and my family before me and how that happened. And then I said, I forgive you too, because you said and did things you shouldn't have, um, particularly against Emma. There were things on both sides of the fence that were said and done that caused the problem. And in that moment, I heard a choir sing near my God to be, it was an audible choir. And I was given this message in that moment. Everything our ancestors experienced with one another, even the pain they may have caused one another, they experience those things, not us. They're on the other side of the veil. They've reconciled those things. It's wrong for us to carry it on because that's what the adversary wants us doing. And he likes us. And more recently, he likes us on that hamster wheel going back in the past and finding all these mistakes Brigham Young or Joseph made and um, giving them reasons to leave the church. Well, that's where the adversary wants us. A lot of that stuff, they go up, but they can't prove 100%. It's just like going back and forth and they're just, they're there. Before they know it, they're, they're out. And I have people asking me all the time, well, what about Lady and Brigham Young? Doesn't that bother you? You know, that bring up all this stuff. No, I don't need to know those things for my salvation. <laughs> That's just a distraction because the adversary does not want me focused on the gospel today and why I'm here in it. And so that's why he wants us drawn away with that kind of distraction. So we're not focused on our role in the gospel today. He knows why we're here. He knows what we're doing. This is like the gathering time period. He knows what's at stake. So, yeah, he's working hard to keep people distracted with all these things that really don't matter right now. That was a different time and different people. If mistakes were made, then they're reconciling them on the other side. It has, we're supposed to be focused on why we're here today. So that's why I like to tell people what I like to tell people. Um, I love to leave with this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. My son and I have done these for like over 20 years. It's not something we get paid for. It's a personal mission to us. And I think this goes for anybody who has a mission. A man filled with the love of God is not content with blessing his family alone, but ranges through the whole world anxious to bless the whole human race. This has been your feeling and caused you to forego the pleasures of home, that you might be a blessing to others who are candidates for immortality, but strangers to truth and for so doing. I pray that heaven's choicest blessings may rest upon you. I think anyone who's involved with humanitarian work, compassionate work, bringing people together, gathering process, healing families, uniting families, that's what this means. And, and we, that's why I do what I do. I want you to know that I you know this gospel is true. I love the Savior with all my heart. Um, he's always there. I never, He's just always there with his arms outstretched. We just have to turn to him. And I love that he, I'm so grateful that he sacrificed his life, that we have a way back to our father in heaven. I'm grateful that my great-great-grandparents sacrificed so much that we could have. 
the fullness of the gospel of the day. I'm always very quick to tell people we don't think we're special because we have that lineage. Joseph couldn't have done what he did without those pioneers helping him. It was a family effort, a group effort. And that's how Heavenly Father wants us working together as a family. I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is really hard for me to even say anything at this point because the spirit is so strong. Um, and I'm sure you all feel that. I want to thank Kimberly for coming into our lives. Um, this is the third event we've had here. And like most of you, we've kind of been gathered here. And there's no coincidence, especially in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I appreciate the message that she shared. It just reminds me of how much I love our dear prophet Joseph and Emma, a woman who went through things that most women would never go through. And Joseph called her a elect lady. I can only imagine when she and Brigham met in the spirit world, it probably was like this. And then a huge hug. She told him thanks for being so strong. And he probably said the same thing to her. So I can't thank you enough. This is a presentation that I know our children need to see. Many of us have children who are struggling in the gospel. No one is perfect but the Lord and Jesus Christ. And I'm so grateful that you're all here. So we're going to take a few minutes if you're okay. Yeah. I'm sure there's going to be some questions. So I'm going to step aside and I'll let you cut that off when you've had enough. Okay, sure. <laughs> Anybody have a blessing? What's that? Um, we'll do that after. So let's take just a few minutes for some questions. You had one earlier. And, and speak loud with your question. Uh, the time of Joseph's death was very chaotic in Nauvoo. There were people who were saying, uh, you need to leave now. And there seems to be, I don't know if it was the same people or other people, were saying, if you help these people leave, like to get across the river, we're going to kill you. Right. That seemed to be such a contradiction. Okay, so that we have that scenario there. And now Emma is trying to figure out what to do with her life. And Brigham Young is saying, hey, we'll take care of these things. It sounded to me from what I heard is that he was willing to handle the debt issues and the financial things if she could just let me take care of the problem. And it sounded like she was not in a mode of trusting that situation. Right. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that scenario that it seems like there were so many conflicting things happening all at once. Yeah, I, and that article by Dallin Oaks, I would suggest you read it because it does go into more depth to explain, you know, how things were. But honestly, when you consider everything that she's been through and all of the losses and um, the whole step of the way, the only person that made sure she was taken care of was her husband, either himself or he would have others uh, make sure that she was looked after. You know, and now he's gone, and she's gone to this day when things happening all the way on on that journey of people she was supposed to have trusted, you know, betraying her, and she honestly doesn't at this point know know who to trust. Um, and so it's it's such a such a conflict because you've got Brigham over here is, is in charge of the survival of the church, and he's going to take that seriously, you know. But he's a very black and white person. You're either with me or you're not. And so when she starts making her own decisions and trying to take care of herself because she, these kids are the only thing of Joseph she's got left, she wants to make sure they're going to survive. She doesn't think anyone's going to look after her interests, so she's got to do it herself. So And the more she does that way, the more he's thinking, she's not with me. No, she's not. So she's over here. So unfortunately, you know, it just... It's just two dynamics that clashed. So a related question, how was she and her progeny able to survive in an area where they're saying, leave now, their her children were at physical risk at, at that time as well. How were they able to successfully stay there? You know, it's interesting because when the mom came through, and Emma was in Fulton, There, nothing happened to their house, which is really interesting that makes you know that it was protected because you would think the first place they would go is there. Um, but she comes back and 
I mean, she goes into full on survival mode. They, when she remarries, um, they have, they have a vineyard. They start running the, the, they use the mansion house as a hotel for a time till the Nauvoo house is finished. And then uh, they're just able to to get by as they can. She did a lot of different things. And she was known, very well known for her medicinal herbs. And she, the doctor would a lot of times send his patients to her. And there was a lot of bartering that went on back then. Uh, sometimes she sold the homes that she owned. She sold the Willard Richards in for $50 for Christmas. So she would have Christmas food. So that's a financial survival. Yeah. Sounds like she was very industrious. She was. Did all the animus the violence did that just somehow dissipate suddenly for her it's it's interesting but when she comes back they left her alone wow but, and then she you know she starts taking her kids to the methodist church because that's really all that's there at the time that's what she's familiar with and i think as people start seeing that they're like well that's not a threat mm -hmm. you know and uh as the citizens come to know her more and how much how giving she is and she took in kids and uh, orphans all, all the way up to almost when she died. When you go on the census records and you see all the people living with her at different times, and there's just stories from people that they, they lived with her for a time. She became one of the best loved citizens of Nauru. Um, yeah, so yeah. yes. The, book, the article by Dan Oak she mentioned, what was the name again? Joseph Smith in the Wake of the Steamboat Nauru. And I'll come up as a PDF BYU uh, thing you can download for free. Yeah. What's the <clears throat> what was her relationship with her mother-in-law? And then how did she meet and what would cause her to marry again? Because that's that causes great controversy or thinking of why. Yeah. What was the reasoning behind her outside of the financial thing to protect? So her? Emma Lucy, Emma and Lucy had a great relationship. They they had a very loving relationship. Gracia Jones wrote a book called Emma and Lucy. I would get that in front of me. But um uh, Lucy loved, loved Emma. Like she helped So that her. had to be hard for them to depart ways because one stays and one goes. No, uh Lucy stayed. She wasn't able to go physically. So they, okay. she would she so that's right, she took care of her. Yeah, she took, okay. she was one of many who took care of her. And then what's the relationship? How did she meet her second husband and why behind that marriage? Yeah, a lot of people get upset because Emma married on Joseph's birthday. Oh, really? But mm -hmm. it just happened. So it happened that, that week, that was the only time period the minister was in town. Mm -hmm. and it was like a traveling minister. So they were only in town every now and then. And um, he was one of two suitors, and she preferred him over the other one. Um, and there, you know, back then women needed to be married to survive. And although he had his flaws, I don't know if you know that he had an affair while he was married to Emma, which produced an illegitimate child. So in the Emma Smith, my story, maybe that's how it starts out. The mother of that child, <clears throat> when he was four, was unable to care for her, care for him. And so he bring she brings him to Emma and asks her to take him in. And Emma, being the woman that she was, took him in, but couldn't bear to see a mother and child separated, so hired the mother to work for her so she could be with her son. Mm -hmm. And on her deathbed, called Louis Vitamin and the woman to her bedside and say, told them to marry after she died to make it right. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of how many direct descendants of Joseph Smith have joined the church? Uh, Jimmy, do you know the latest? It used to be like direct Descendant converts were about 350, but that was like five years ago. Yeah, and then when you bring in spouse and children, it was around 3,000, 3, 10%. Yeah, I didn't know that there was a promise made that our family would return. We're seeing that. So that's it. Okay, DNC 109, uh, the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. There's one part of there where it talks about the prejudices. And it's talking about Emma and her immediate relations, that their prejudices will be swept away as of the flood. And the way it reads, you know, you tell us something about somewhere in the generations that that will happen. That's happening in our generations. So that's, that's being forgotten.